Hey, welcome back. Today I'm working on the electrical system for the back of the van. I'm not trying to run a whole lot. At this point, it's really just lights. I'm also going to power a subwoofer off the house battery. When I finish the interior build, I'm going to set up with a lithium battery and a very elaborate charging system, and I'll show you that down the road. But for the time being, I just picked up a cheap uh, deep cycle flooded lead acid battery off of Facebook Marketplace for 20 bucks, and I've got it in a battery box. I'm going to set up a charging system for that and a fuse box so that I can run a few things, including lights, off of that battery. So stick around, I'll take you on a tour of that system and show you how it's all set up. I'm setting up my electrical utility panel under the passenger side in the back. So here's the battery box that I've got. Uh, you can see I've got some wires run. Those are tied into the second starting battery. These E350s have two starting batteries. One's under the hood and one is under the passenger side frame rail. And so I've got that running right now just up to a really cheap voltage sensing relay. This is like a $20 voltage sensing relay. And that just links these two batteries, the starting system and the house battery system in parallel when the engine's running. So yeah, that voltage sensing relay is just a switch that links the two batteries when the voltage in the starting battery hits 13.3 volts, in other words, when the alternator's charging, and disconnects when the voltage drops. This way the house battery receives charge from the alternator, but using the house battery can't deplete the starting battery. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tie in some breakers, so I've got some 60 amp breakers, and a fuse block so that I can run a couple of things without going directly off of terminals of these batteries, because as I set this up just for... Uh, temporary use, you can see I've got a mess of wires and fuses and bare wire attached to battery terminals, and that's not good practice. So I'm going to clean this all up and make it nice. I find DC electrical systems to be pretty straightforward. Uh, there's simply a positive and a negative wire. So here's the starting battery that's under the frame rail in my diagram, and I'm going to run that positive to a breaker. That breaker is going to run to the VSR. The VSR is grounded. Uh, the starting battery is also grounded on the negative side. And then the VSR is going to run to another breaker, and that's going to run into my fuse block. The fuse block has a positive and a negative distribution. Uh, the positive is going to come from the breaker to the fuse block and the aux battery. And then the negative is going to go to the fuse panel and to the ground. So this is all pretty straightforward. Now where things can go haywire is with connections. Uh, I personally am a big fan of good connections, and so I'm going to show you how I crimp things. I'm going to give you a quick overview on some of the tools that I use. This is a stripper crimper multi-tool, so this can be used to strip solid and stranded wire, and also crimp butt connectors and ring terminals and so on and so forth. Uh, now these are fine, if you have no other tool this is the one to use, uh, but it's not my preference. I will use this to strip wires, and it's handy just to have around because it has a little pair of pliers on the end, um, so I use that sometimes. You can also just have a stripper. This one I don't use very much. Um, and this just strips wire, uh, and it has a little pair of pliers as well, but this doesn't do crimping. For crimping, I prefer a tool like this. This is a ratcheting crimper. And the beauty of this tool is that as you crimp down, it holds and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And this provides a perfect crimp every time. This is a far superior tool to the multi-tool crimper style. And if you're going to buy a good set of tools, I would highly recommend getting a ratcheting crimp tool. Now for cutting larger wire, you're going to need something that has a bigger blade. Uh, I picked up this WorkPro and it's working pretty well. I've cut up to three aught wire with this one. To crimp larger wires, there are a variety of options. This is my preference. This is the FTZ Correct Crimp. You can see this is a big tool. As opposed to the hydraulic style crimpers, this provides a hexagonal crimp with no wings this is really a beautiful tool. They're around $200 and well worth the investment. The hydraulic tools you'll find um, vary in quality. I broke one on my first run using it and uh, never looked back. So these are the tools that I use. Let me show you some of the supplies. Okay, starting with wire. Wire has gotten crazy expensive. I like to purchase marine grade tinned copper wire. Now, you'll find a lot of options. You'll find uh, copper clad aluminum, CCA. 
Uh, aluminum is not as good of a conductor as copper, and so to get the same conductivity, you're going to need bigger wire. And then you'll see this oxygen-free copper uh, in places. This is not a marine grade tinned wire, but this is pure copper. So this is a second choice for me. Um, but your best bet is marine grade tinned wire. Uh, so if I were to strip this back, you'd see that those strands are all silver. Uh, they're copper inside. So that tinning over the strands provides protection against corrosion. So I have here some 6AWG, some 8AWG, and some 16 gauge wire. Um, those are going to pretty much round out my installation. In DC electrical systems, conductor size is really important. Blue Sea Systems provides this helpful chart to determine what gauge wire you need for a given application. As your wire runs get longer and or carry more amps of power, you'll need to increase the sizing of the wire. If the wire is undersized, you'll lose voltage to resistance, which in the extreme can cause heat, melt connections, and even cause fires. So when buying wire, refer to a size chart like this one, don't cheap out, and when in doubt, go bigger. Okay, taking a look at lugs and connectors. These are your basic butt connectors. Now, I prefer the marine grade heat shrink connectors that are adhesive lined because that's going to uh, hold better on the wire. It provides some strain relief so it's not just a mechanical connection for the crimp and they seal the connection pretty well so that you don't get uh, corrosion. They range from uh, 22 AWG up through 10 and they're based on color. So I crimp these on with that ratcheting crimper and then I hit them with a heat gun or a lighter and that gives a pretty good connection. Over here I have some spade terminals. Uh, this is for my speaker connections. This is a brand that I haven't uh, purchased before. There's a million options on uh, the internet and you can just look at what's out there and what's available. Uh, yeah, we'll see how these do. This, uh, These AIRIC Eric brand terminals are uh, lug connectors that I've used extensively. So this is gonna be my uh, 12 through 4 AWG kit. And then I've got a couple for smaller and larger studs. I've got some ring terminals from a previous project here. And then we get to the big boys. When I'm crimping heavy gauge wire, uh, these are what I use. These are FTZ power lugs. So you can see these are a straight lug. Uh, they are heavy tinned copper. And there's room on these for two hexagonal crimps. And these are, uh, they're expensive. These run like three, four dollars a piece. Um, but these are going to provide the best connection possible. The last step for me is to heat shrink those connections. That's going to minimize the chance of any water getting in or uh, corrosion setting in. So, so I'll typically coat my wire ends with a little bit of dielectric grease, crimp on my terminals, and then heat shrink on top. Now these heat shrink kits that you can buy are all right, but you'll find they come stacked with these tiny wire sizes that are often pretty useless. So it's better to just buy a roll of heat shrink by the foot in the sizes that you most often use because you'll get it way, way, way cheaper. Um, and also I like my heat shrinks to be a little longer than these. Uh, I like to cut them, you know, uh, twice the length of the crimp connector. So that's the roundup on tools that I use. Let's look at sizing lugs. So Lugs have two sizes. One is for the wire that it accepts, and the other is for the stud. And so I'm making a cable that will go from my uh, breaker to this VSR. So let's look at this lug on this terminal, and I'll show you what a correct fit looks like. So that's the correct size. You can see there's no gap between the lug and the terminal. So if I were to use that over here on this stud, while that goes over, you can see there is a gap. Now that gap results in a weaker connection and that can cause resistance. Resistance equals heat, heat equals fire. So this is not ideal. That's the roundup on tools that I use. Now let's make some crimps. I always test and make sure that I've got the right lugs for the job. before cutting my wire and setting up to crimp. So the distance here is just a couple inches. So I'm just gonna cut a short piece of six gauge wire. 
You always need a little bit more than you think because these terminal ends take up a good bit of space on the end. So now I'm gonna measure this to here. I'm just holding that up and then I'm gonna make a mark with my thumbnail and then I'm gonna uh, remove the insulation at that point. I'm always careful doing this not to cut wire strands because every strand that you damage is less carrying capacity for that connection. And as I said before, good connections limit resistance and that's what we're shooting for. Now we can measure and see that that's going to be about right. So that's perfect. We can see no gaps between the lug connector and the wire. I'm gonna fit a heat shrink onto there. If you're, if you have an open end, that's fine. We can do this later. But if this end of the wire goes to something else, we wanna put the heat shrink on before we crimp that on there. Before I finish this crimp, I'm just gonna put a little dielectric on here. That'll just help prevent corrosion down the line. Now we're ready to crimp. The FTZ has dies that are adjustable. So I can change these dies to fit the size of lug. Now, and there's a chart here for whether we're dealing with flared lugs or straight uh, power lugs. Now I already have this set up with KK. That's our appropriate size for six AWG. And now I'm gonna make my crimps. So that's a pretty good hexagonal crimp right there. Give it a second. And so there's the finished crimps. I like to finish those off just by rounding them a little bit with the crimp tool. So I'll take this back and spin it a few times. So you can see there, we end up with a really beautiful crimp. A properly done crimp like this is an airtight connection. This is a stronger connection than solder. Folks have this misconception that a soldered connection is superior, but solder doesn't hold up well to vibration. This crimp connection is a permanent connection that's never gonna fail. It's airtight, watertight. It's effectively a cold forged seal between the conductor and the lug. Notably, the pressure is calibrated, so none of those uh, wire strands inside are broken there. Uh, with our hammer, with the hammer crimpers, or any kind of the hydraulic crimpers, oftentimes we'll go over pressure and break off strands inside, and that's not good for our connection. That can cause resistance and heat down the line. So this is what we're looking for in terms of a crimp. Uh, that's my preference, anyways. If you have strong opinions, leave a comment below and let me know why I'm doing this wrong. Now I'm just going to heat shrink this connection to finish it. Beautiful. I apply heat until I start to see the adhesive ooze out around the heat shrink. And uh, it's better to do this with a heat gun, but I'm working out on the street here, so a uh, lighter will suffice if you're careful. There, I've got my wire made up, and that's what the connection will look like once I get it mounted. I've got the voltage sensing relay all wired in. Here's our positive feed from the start battery that goes through a 60 amp breaker to the voltage sensing relay over to the aux battery breaker and then that's wired to the positive terminal on the aux battery. So that is a really simple way to basically put the batteries in parallel. Because the house battery is a flooded lead acid and the starting batteries for the van are also flooded lead acid, this will work just fine. Uh, when I go to lithium, this charging system is going to go away. I'm going to replace it with something that's a little smarter that can match the charging profile needed by those lithium batteries because it's not the best idea to mix chemistries. 
Uh, there's a lot of debate about that, and some folks say you can do it just fine, some folks say you can't, but uh, I think the best solution is to match the charging profile to the type of battery, and the alternator in the van will charge this flooded lead acid battery appropriately. So this gives us a simple setup. Uh, like I said, that VSR was like 20 bucks. So really simple setup for, uh, for charging this inexpensive battery. Now I just need to wire in this fuse block and that's gonna give me the ability to run negatives off the top and positives off the bottom. Uh, so this is gonna get wired into the breaker over here uh, and to the negative on the house battery. So here's our simple electrical system all wired up. We have power in on the left from the start battery through a breaker to a voltage sensing relay. From the voltage sensing relay, it goes to another breaker, which feeds the house battery and a fuse block. So this is a good simple system that I can use to power a variety of electronics. For the time being, it's just gonna be lights and a subwoofer and uh, we'll get things wired up and we'll see how it works. I've got the van running. Watch what happens when I close the circuit breaker. It takes a few seconds, and then the voltage sensing relay kicks on. You'll see the red light illuminate. There we go. And we're charging. So there's a simple house battery installation. It's nothing fancy, but it'll meet my needs for the time being. If you're interested in electrical projects, hit the like button and let me know in the comments below, and I'll be sure to share more over the next couple months. As always, thanks for watching. See you again soon.